what we're going to do in this panel is, um, first of all, provide you some objectives. Uh, we have a lot of diversification, as you just heard from, from John Luke. So, wide variety of perspectives about impact investing and how to make money and to generate benefits. We also want to focus on evidence, evidence that you can actually make money and generate those, those benefits. Uh, in the absence of a lot of quantitative evidence, at least anecdotal information. And very importantly, we want to keep this practical for investors so that we're going to talk about how you actually embed those impact investing objectives at each stage of the investment process, all the way from sourcing, due diligence, value creation, and very importantly, responsible exits. So when you come to exit your company, how do you protect that mission that you've worked so hard to, to build? Um, the other very important part of this discussion will be about the costs of implementation. And um, with all of the reporting for all the metrics and all the rest, let's remember that as investors, our first responsibility is investing, not generating a lot of paperwork. So let's find ways that, with the panel's help that we can uh, really focus on the metrics that matter. And then finally, I um, want to talk about a very important factor, the benefits for the local communities in which we invest. What are we doing for that um, rural poverty, for economic development? As Jean-Michel and Servatino mentioned this morning, how do we get those growth rates up? So um, that's the objective for the panel. Um, please ask questions at any point you want. But um, I just wanted to highlight for you some of the diversification across the panelists, and in a minute they will amplify. But um, Vivina um, will give us not only the perspective of a fund of funds, but a limited partner. The rest of us are, are, are GPs. Um, Longtime investor, Serona, back from 60 years ago, and um, has seen the evolution, even though it wasn't called impact investing in those days. And not just Africa, but a global investor, really focusing on frontier markets. And um, again, uh, maybe a little bit larger deal size than some of the, the other panelists. Laureen, um, as many of you know from ProParco, um, many friends in the, in the, the audience, and um, can shed some light on, I think, a very important trend as people spin out of the DFIs. You know how important they are to the development in Africa. Um, can talk about um, a real professional spin out from a DFI and hopefully a role model for some others. Pan-African, and she'll, she'll um, certainly be able to exp uh, explain why, and very diversified, debt and equity. And by the way, my organization, Emerging Markets Private Equity Association, has now changed its name to include debt and credit and mezzanine. So I think um, you will be hearing from several panels. We want to come up with innovative ways to um, promote growth. And then um, Paul, um, <laughs> long time impact investor, although you still don't want to call yourself an impact investor, um, in renewable energy back from 1982, um, focusing now not just on renewable energy, but also healthcare, housing, education, in Ghana, Kenya, Zimbabwe, and um, again, mostly debt. And we'll hear um, the, the balance story about debt and equity, and generally smaller deals than the other people on the panel. And then Martin, uh, many of you know Martin from his distinguished career working with the development uh, finance institutions, starting with CDC, but also EIB, and the African Development Bank. Um, but now, um, with a new fund, Moringa, uh, many of you know the, the derivation of the, the, the name, but we'll let Paul um, amplify um, Martin Amplify, um, not only in Africa, but also Latin America, and um, uh, really focusing on a, a differentiable segment from the other panelists, agroforestry, and um, landowners, smallholder farmers, mainly private equity, but also some debt. So that's, uh, that should give you an idea of the diverse range of perspectives. And now I want each one of the panelists just to spend a very brief moment explaining 
why they have chosen to seek financial returns as well as social and environmental benefits and how they're doing it, just to amplify a little bit. Martin, I'm going to talk, ask you to, to start. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, uh, good day to everybody. Nice to be here. Um, so uh, with Moringa, uh, we have a specific strategy, agroforestry. I won't go through it in great detail, but it involves planting trees and crops and associating the two together for synergistic reasons. And I think we, we, we believe that that's a, a, a very a powerful way of investing in land-based investments. We think it's a, a way of achieving financial objectives, uh, uh, particularly diversification is present uh, in the markets we sell into. We sell food, and we sell biomass, we sell timber. Um, but it also allows us to uh, achieve our environmental and social goals uh, by associating the right trees and crops. We can create uh, synergies between the two, for example. And as Pat mentioned, uh, we also have a vision which includes the uh, association of uh, a large number of smallholders with our projects. And hence, we, we achieve the social impact of, uh, of our investments through the association of, of large numbers of smallholders, uh, improving their livelihoods and, and providing them with access to uh, more diversified, uh, more stable incomes uh, over the long term. So we fundamentally believe that it's an interesting way uh, to invest uh, uh, using land as, uh, as one of the main uh, uh, aspects of what we're, we're doing. Um, it's not the only way, but we think it's a very interesting way. We, uh, so we're, we're in this to, uh, to achieve uh, the three goals. One of the questions that, uh, um, that uh, Pat has put to us, let me uh, really get the microphone right here, um, <laughs> hope you can hear, um, is, um, uh, is to uh, embrace both the financial and the impact side. So in answer to the question, are we finance or impact? We are both, we, we embrace both firmly. We do believe that they are mutually reinforcing. So this is not about uh, herding uh, cats which are running off in different directions. We believe fundamentally that uh, these three things reinforce businesses and hence uh, we, we place ourselves in between the two uh, key objectives. Um, we work, as, uh, as was mentioned, in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. We are doing deals of between 5 and 10 million uh, euros in size. Um, we have raised about 70 million euros uh, to date. Uh, we have a final closing coming up uh, imminently uh, to implement that strategy. We just did our first deal in Latin America uh, recently, which is a, a coffee-based business, coffee being grown under tree shade. Um, and uh, uh, we, we target in our uh, investment uh, portfolio a return of somewhere around 10 to 12% net, uh, as well as uh, measuring, benchmarking and measuring uh, very clear environmental and social impacts uh, in, in our portfolio. Thank you. And Bavina, I know you feel very strongly about this question, so why don't you explain why? <laughs> Um, I suppose the first question you asked was why, and uh, if I can share with you something personal, I actually worked for 15 years in London in what I now call the dark side. So I was working with Mary Lynch investment managers and Gartmore and making investments in private equity in the large buyout funds like the KKR, Carlyles and Warburg Pincus of this world. I think that if we have learned anything, which unfortunately I don't think we have, from the crisis of 2008, is that the way that investors approach investments for profit only and the excessive use of leverage has brought us down a very dangerous path. And it was at about that time that I actually shifted and joined Sarona as Pat was saying, Serona is a private equity fund of fund. We focus exclusively on frontier and emerging markets. That means Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And we focus exclusively on growth stage SMEs. Jean-Michel Severino was describing SMEs as very small enterprises. He was talking about average deal size of 50,000, 100,000, maybe up to a million. And I think in that case, it is fair to say that there is an arbitrage to be made. There is a trade-off between impact and financial returns. But that's not where Sarona plays. We believe that is actually not possible, but proven, that if you invest, and it's what uh, Martin was saying, you can find 
good growth stage company, post revenue, post profit, invest, I don't know, between five and 25 million dollars in those companies for minority stakes, run them very well, and we will talk about environmental social governance criteria, and make commercial rate of returns. And again, you will hear, I think, from all of us, that applying strong focus and rigor to environmental social governance issues ultimately is going to help you generate better returns than by not doing it. Thank you. And Paul, all the way from 1982 to today, evolving through this business. So why have you chosen? Well, <clears throat> there's actually a simple reason for that. Um, SMEs, as Jean-Michel explained, make sense in the societies that we're looking at. So they're just plain vanilla business cases. Um, our range is from 50,000 upwards to a couple of million. Uh, we could do a 50,000 first stage investment, um, assuming that uh, the investment grows after time so that we can invest a little bit more. And at that stage, say 500,000 to a couple of million, you are looking at commercially viable deals in Africa. Um, so why we do this is that it makes sense since we provide growth capital. And that's capital that is not available in Africa. What you can get is 40% interest rate, three weeks, six weeks, three months, maybe uh, loans that you have to renew. That you can use if you can afford it for working capital, but you can never invest. You can never build a, build a factory or invest in something that takes a little bit of time. That's the capital that we provide, and we provide that capital with the experience that we have many years in investing in and divesting from SMEs. So what did we do to make that work? First, we provide debt and equity. In an SME, other than in a corporate, there's little use in structuring, leveraging, what have you. We are often with one more investor. We always invest with somebody else. The only investor. So there's no bank that we can leverage with at that point. It's ourselves whom we leverage with. So it's just for the cash, creating the cash flow and, and stay, staying at a minority share that we provide 20% average, 20% equity and 80% debt. That. That's number one. Secondly, we focus on SMEs, as Jean-Michel has explained, that since they are the catalyst, the motor in the economy for all kinds of reasons, I need not to go in there anymore. And thirdly, our investors are mostly private investors. So they are successful entrepreneurs who have built and sold a company and know what it is to do that. So they are uh, appreciated by our entrepreneurial model. And since they have made good fortune, they want to invest their portfolio, including something in Africa. And the fact that they invest in Africa, that's all the impact that we offer them. We say it's a decent deal, it's a fair return. I don't know what a commercial return is, so we say a fair return. Um, and on top of that, we say we invest in what we call uh, essential services, essential services for the development of emerging ma markets or countries. So that's healthcare, that's housing, construction, that's education, private schools, and that's clean energy. And that too is for a reason based in the commercial argument, which is that those services uh, offer you the highest upside. There's a big, big need for all those services. And if there were a downturn, and we've seen one in Ghana where we invest recently, those sectors are still very robust since everybody still needs housing, education, energy, and health. So that's basically what we do as a, as a job. Thank you. Thank you. And Lorraine, uh, why did you decide to spin out of ProParco and what are you doing differently? Um, thank you. First of all, Patricia, I will, have to, I will have to switch in French. I think it will be oh. easier for me. So apologies for um, the rest of the panel. La première chose que je dirais, c'est donc à la réponse pourquoi? Parce so the first answer to the why the team that created Amitis is a team that comes from Proparco, and 
So the impact investing is part of our DNA. The only difference is that we chose to do it slightly differently, first and foremost because we focused on the African continent. And we are an investment fund that exclusively invests on this African continent. And the second thing is to the question uh, to whether we choose impact or return, I'd like to say that we choose both. And we define ourselves as long-term responsible investments investors for the continent. How do we do impact by f with five criteria? First of all, we bring long-term resources on a continent which has not got many long-term resources. And the second thing is that we are extremely flexible in the kind of instruments we bring in. As the people in this panel, we invest in debt equity and quasi-equity. And the key of our approach is to give instruments that define and respond to the specific needs of a company in which we invest. So the key of our investment strategy is really to work with entrepreneurs on the long term in the consolidation of their strategic positioning in their expansion, regional or local expansion. The objective is that our activity and our strategy contribute to the creation, to the emergence and consolidation of local champions, regional or even continental champions. This is the first criteria of impact. That's why we have an investment strategy which is exclusively minority. And our objective is really to fit in the accompanying and the long term. And I'd like to say that even if we do have this approach, we make sure that our investment policy still respects ESG criteria, which are quite specific, actually, in that every single investment that we make will goes hand in hand with due deals, which are very um, focused on the impact that our target society has as an environment. And it also focuses on its weaknesses in its environment and the social environment, and we also implement action plans. So we really and truly are in institutionalization of governance by the creation of national champions. We work with funding on the long term and flexibly work with this. And the fourth thing, which is extremely original, which allows us to define ourselves as impact investors, and that we allow local institutions, which have many local liquidities, to reinvest in the economic um, tissue of the countries they are, because we've created a vehicle that's dedicated to an area which is called um, it is West Africa. And the objective is to get long-term savings and reinvest them in a local makeup of a company and a society in Asia. So we are responsible long-term investors. And for us, the impact is defined in several ways. First of all, why have a criteria which is flexible and responsible to the specificities of the companies in which we help out. Merci. So now we are going to move on. And now that you've um, heard from each one of the panelists, finance is essential. And it's not a trade off for us. Finance is embedded. So, how do we do that? How do we embed that nexus of financial and social and environmental impact in each stage of the investment process? starting with filters for the kinds of deals you will and will not look at and due diligence. Now, um, Vivina, you had mentioned that as a fund of funds and as a minority shareholder in some of these companies, the importance of due diligence on your managers who are in turn selecting. Talk about practically the difference between you and a traditional private equity investor when you do due diligence? So maybe just to put it a little bit in context, um, Sarona today has invested in seven African funds in total, and this is North African and Sub-Saharan Africa. In total, these seven funds have deployed or are deploying, because not all of them have finished investing, $640 million on the continent. Today, there is 52 companies that have received equity, and uh, our, Sarona's, overall commitment to these seven funds is about $20 million. We are growing, therefore our ticket size to the funds is growing. Um, the current average ticket size is between eight and $10 million. So as Pat is saying, we invest in funds such as Sovec and Moringa. 
they in turn, Amethyst actually, <laughs> uh, although Amethyst is too big for us, we invest in smaller funds who do smaller deals. So Pat is asking, what is the difference in the way that we do due diligence from the way that the GPs do due diligence? And it presents some challenges because clearly we are one step removed from the companies. What is very important for us is to spend time with the GP, not just doing quantitative analysis on the deals that they have done in the past, but actually spending time with them in their offices and visiting the companies in which they have invested in the past so that we can actually make sure that there is something in the DNA of the fund manager that will give us the comfort that they will apply the same kind of ethical, moral, social, environmental values and priorities which ultimately we want them to bring to the companies in which they invest. And uh, it's something that can only be done by spending time with the people. So many times we receive pitch books and presentations and DDQs and RFPs with all these wonderful statements of all this importance that they attach to questionnaires and to you know, lists of measures and quantities and metrics. And then you go and visit them and actually they don't walk the talk. So, I suppose that is really the key to ensuring that uh, And when they don't, um, what happens? Um, Paul, you talk about broken deals. Talk about what happens when a company that you are looking at, an, an entrepreneur, an enterprise, will violate some of the principles. Well, that's a um, um, very painful question, financially speaking, I mean. Uh, since it may mean, and it in our case meant two cases, that we had gone past due diligence, agreed on a term sheet, and between signing and executing, we found out a few things, and we stopped the deal, and we lost tens of thousands of legal costs and other costs and time spent on a deal, since uh, this was a particular hospital that we were going to invest in, with a high-end quality strategy, which is usually what we do. We bring in, say, smart health, if you like. We don't invest in traditional hospitals, not in beds and nurses in general. Um, and it was meant to uh, serve a, it was on a maternity uh, clinic to serve a particular target group. And we were not convinced at the end of the day that this entrepreneur was going to stick to that choice. And once we got uncertain, we started asking around even deeper than during due diligence. And we got uncertain and that uncertainty was not addressed properly and we dropped the deal. Very, very painful. Um, Lauren, you mentioned action plans. So um, how do you incorporate those ESG principles impact from the very beginning in the action plan? And have you, like Paul, had to turn down companies because they don't comply? Well, indeed, it is a process that is time-consuming, and uh, there are several steps to this. First, the key is really to build a specific relationship based on trust with the entrepreneurs we're working with, with investees. When we are minority stakeholder, it means that we were selected somehow, we were chosen, and in the long run, we will be working with the entrepreneur. So the first thing is to understand what the environment is about and to come up with a due diligence process to consider, consider the environmental and societal impact of the company. This due diligence will lead to an action plan, uh, actions and measures that should be rolled out in order to make corrective actions since uh, the company may have an, a negative impact on the environment and improve societal practices. But it's even more than that. The action plans is linked to legal documents that were signings with the entrepreneur who is a minority stakeholder. So that means that he makes a decision to actually implement uh, uh, these, these uh, rules. And we uh, also add palliative measures as incentives, if you will, to encourage the entrepreneur to actually respect the measures. We have legal frameworks that help, uh, that will allow us to withdraw 
to exit the company like a divorce if these environmental and societal uh, 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 criteria are not abided by. At the end of the day, and I'm insisting on it, what matters really is not to force the company entrepreneurs to actually implement these criteria and measures, but rather to make the interpreter understand how important that is for his own business, for his own a competitive edge. Uh, it is important to accept all these principles. Today, the world we live in, uh, all companies, all sectors are funded by DFIs, so, uh, development institution funds that implement the best practices in their own businesses. So it is in the common interest of banks, of a company, private sector, any way to abide by these international standards. That's a must, must be, must have. Uh, it will have a virtual cycle on the overall business. And so that gradually there will be a positive impact on the overall chain. So this multiple effect that we want to impose on the entrepreneurs should not be seen as a constraint, but it is the key of impact investment, you know, to make people understand that it is an obligation that is necessary in virtuals, indeed. It's great, and Jim, definitely value added. But now, Martin, I want to talk to you uh, about value added. Um, after the due diligence, after the action plans, give some examples because in agroforestry, probably a lot of these small farm holders don't even know what impact investing is or financial or other. So um, you, you've talked about um, the, the certification, the organic farm. Um, give us some examples how you embed that value added. Uh, th thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Moringa works with uh, an idea which is to invest in nucleus properties with many smallholders associated around the, those properties. Um, uh, as you rightly say, Pat, the, the smallholders have very different profiles uh, from very tiny, tiny scale, um, uh, very poor individuals to slightly larger scale uh, operators uh, depending on the country and the continent. It's different in Africa to Latin America, we, I think we could say. Um, what do we do specifically to uh, embed impact at the smallholder level? Well, it's, it's, it's a number of things. Firstly, uh, you provide uh, through your large-scale nucleus project a route to market, uh, which may be hard for those smallholders uh, to access otherwise. You may, if you apply certification like fair trade certification, um, like organic certification, like Rainforest Alliance certification to your core project, you may also be able to provide access to premium markets, which those smallholders would otherwise not uh, easily be able to access. So there is a market-based advantage which can be passed down to uh, the smallholder level. Uh, but there's also a range of other things, uh, of course, in terms of capacity building and training, which, uh, which can be done. Uh, to make sure that uh, the small, at the smallholder level the approach is understood, that the right genetic material is provided. That's often a big challenge for, uh, for, for smallholders to have access to the right genetic material to uh, uh, obtain the productivity uh, and, uh, uh, and output that they, uh, that they should have. Um, access to know-how in terms of farming methods, uh, uh, understanding of how to get commercial value from the trees that they're growing, which is, of course, a more long-term thing. So there's a whole range of things which allow uh, the impact in terms of um, uh, overall improvements in revenue uh, at the smaller level to be uh, achieved. Uh, just if you permit me to come back to the last subject also quickly, mm -hmm. Pat, uh, on, on, the, on the filtering side. I want to just give a quick example of, of how we filter out things at the, at the early stages, uh, mid middle stages of our process. And I'll pick a social example, uh, just illustrative. Um, we have, uh, we've been looking recently at a, a deal in West Africa where it is land-based. We have this nucleus project of about 600 hectares involved. Um, that's uh, uh, based on a property which was originally granted to a company in the 70s and 80s uh, uh, in a different social context. And right now we're looking carefully at whether or not the way that was granted by local government um, in that country was actually done un under circumstances which ultimately were behind uh, the, the civil war which took place in, in that country in the, in the 90s. Uh, if our conclusion is that uh, um, we, are, we would be, by reanimating this same old plantation, be again bedding in social issues which, er, which caused problems in the past, then the deal is dropped. Just a very simple example of, 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 of how social criteria can be used to, to filter out things. Uh, and it's a live debate uh, and, and, and something we're looking at right now. If it's complicated, which it probably will be, then we would apply some kind of uh, further investigative work uh, using social aspects to really understand whether there is an issue or not. Right, and as Lauren said, whether you can correct it. 
Okay, now, exits. Um, there, there's a lot of research going on on what is a responsible exit. In other words, you've worked so hard on the diligence stage and the value creation to embed these metrics, these values into your company, and then it's time to sell or to list. And how do you protect that mission? Now, Lorraine, I, I think you use some legal protections, do you? Um, not necessarily legal protection, necessarily legal protection but, but the first thing is that it is a process. Uh, the acceptance of these criteria is a, a fully fledged process. Concrete example, we came up with an investment two years ago with a retail company, Gas and, and Oil. Petro Ivoire and Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. Uh, it has a business that has, of course, an impact on the environment, but also on the local uh, populations uh, uh, regarding production sites. So this investment led to uh, the design and environmental and social policy. The policy was in set in stone, it was not part of the DNA company with the statuses. So from the moment the policy is accepted indeed and part of the operating rules of the company, it is very difficult for the company to get rid of them unless the new uh, shareholder, uh, a new shareholder comes up and modify the operating mode. That's the second bonus. We are a minority stakeholder, right? So the support and respect of the policy by min uh, minority shareholders, the only way to make sure that the exit can protect what we set up. Yet again, uh, the discussions, these procedures should not be seen as an obligation at the prison, if you will, for companies. If these measures are desired, understood, accepted, then they're part of a new operating mode of the company. Regardless of the new investors we're exiting from, we can make sure that these rules are here to stay. And lastly, we did not do any exit with MATs, but referring to the past, uh, I think uh, uh, MATs would do just like Propaco did. We select partners who are part of our investment philosophy because it, we must make sure that there's no disruption and that there's no divorce, really. And Paul, um, I know you have um, exited partially from other deals, another advantage of debt. Talk about how that enables you to embed um, the mission as you, as you Yeah, that's, so we have actually two elements and one is to Lorene is that uh, the impact that we try to achieve is a competitive advantage to the individual companies that we invest in. So any buyer or any newcomer that takes us out would be stupid to get rid of that competitive advantage. And just to give you an example, um, we have invested in schools, schools who provide the local curriculum, so not international, but local, including, uh, say, uh, regional languages and all that, really to the needs of that country. Um, and our impact measurement there is that students need, to, of course, they need to get a certificate. That's, that's, a, that's not even an issue. The issue is, can they pick as a next level the school of choice that they want to go to? And they can. That's what we sort of establish as a quality measurement. Now, in order to do that, you have to pay your teachers a decent salary. And of course, in schools, that is the highest cost that you have. So there's a tendency to not pay your teachers enough and then they you know they fall sick or they have other jobs so making sure that the owners understand that paying your teachers a decent salary and have a sort of complementary motivation package so that they really deliver well qualified students is what we do and once that is established for three or four years we have a horizon of five years uh, you see that it is part and parcel of what the school does and then the next owner won't think even of changing that now, while we build that, as you said, Pat, we uh, start exiting by that 80% of our investment is in debt. So often in the, after the second or the third year of our investment, we see money coming back. And right now, I think we have called 85, maybe 90% of our current fund. So there's still money to be called. We have already started <coughs> repaying to our investors, which shows two things. Confidence to the investors that we can do what we promise and a sort of um, uh, um, um, 
an, an instrument to our entrepreneurs that they uh, meet their obligations, which you can often uh, restructure. If it's debt, you can easily uh, restructure the debt, but that there is a repayment coming towards us is very important, not just for the return, also for the relationship between the investor and the entrepreneur. And I know we have limited amount of time, but on the whole question of evidence, we do need more exits. We need financial as well as social and environmental information, evidence on what kinds of returns you can achieve. And I'm delighted to say um, we, we made a press release about three weeks ago. Um, our organization, Merger Markets Private Equity Association, and the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania are building the first comprehensive, rigorous database will include exits, will include entry valuations, will include evidence of value added, so that for the first time, we can look quantitatively as well as qualitatively and start making, testing some of those hypotheses about how you drive value in impact investing. And I urge all of you to get in touch with, with me, with Wharton, with Impia, um, to give us your data, including all of my, my panelists up here as well. The, um, the, the, the more funds we have, the more robust the database will be. How much time do we have left on this panel? Do uh, we, we have uh, <laughs> about 15 minutes. How much? 15, oh, that is the largest. And you're, the very ten, ten, you're very generous. You're very generous. 10 sharp. Okay, great, great. So now let's move on and talk about metrics. I know there's going to be another discussion this afternoon, a presentation on, on metrics, particularly with the, with the gin. But um, there are costs associated with, with the metrics. And I think, Lauren, you, you mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's based on trust and all the rest. But um, anecdotally and quantitatively, Talk about the metrics that matter. Vivian, I'm looking at you first because I know you've got your metrics on your website. How did you choose those and are they in a burden? How, do, how much do they cost to monitor? Um, thank you, but can I just take two minutes because you mentioned the, uh, the study that you're going to commission or you have commissioned to Wharton. At Sarona, we actually did a similar study, but we took 10 GPs that were at the top of our pipeline. And we actually looked back at all the investments that those 10 GPs made between 2002 and 2012. And they had made 123 investments. And this is not just Africa, this is Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And they very rough, I mean, we, and, and we did a deep dive and we asked each one of those GPs, why they invested in the company that they invested in, how much, how did they add value, why did they exit, who did they exit to, and what was the return that they achieved. And uh, again, I realize that I'm in a law firm, so for disclaimer, we are not fundraising, <laughs> and this is our own <laughs> internal studies and sources. So. I will deny having said any of this, <laughs> but um, out of those 10 GPs, 13 funds, 123 companies, the GPs deployed $1 billion, roughly. They had exited about $1 billion. They still had $1 billion working on the ground, and the gross IRR was 19.5%, uh, and the multiple on capital was over two. So it is possible. People do exit. Great. And of course, these are our f sort of preferred 10 GPs that we found, having selected them from a much larger universe. But I am really looking forward to the, uh, because of course, ours had a bias. They were a selection of people and GPs that we liked. So if you're just going to have a much broader, more representative universe, I presume the results might be different. To um, the question of metrics uh, and the cost of metrics and how do you try, because uh, one of the things about impact is that uh, apart from the intent and apart from adding value, there is the question of how do you then measure it? And it's tricky, it's really tricky because there is a balance between measuring impact and letting, and again, we are a fund of fun, but letting the GP doing their work and their work is 
finding a good company, helping the good company to grow, grow in the right way so that they can then exit at the highest possible multiple. So the way we, we, we try to do it is we have selected 33 iris metrics, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, the fact that the gin has actually also associated itself with gears and iris to both rate managers, but also to have a taxonomy of statistics and metrics to see how things develop. It's early days, because when you measure these metrics, it's not just at a point in time that it is important. You want to know how it evolves over time. Is the capital that we collectively deploy into these economies and companies actually improving things? And so how did, you know, Pat asked, how did we choose those 33 metrics? As a fund of fund and as a multi-sector or sector agnostic fund of fund, we, we exclude certain sectors. So we wouldn't do mining, extractive resources, anything harmful we would just exclude. But in terms of measuring the positive impact, because we are so diversified, then we have to take metrics that are relevant for potentially all our comp sorry, all our companies. And so we look at governance in the sense of, you know, what are the um, steps that have been taken to make sure that there is a board? And is the board diversified? Is it independent? How many are men? How many are women? Management team, jobs, jobs created, but not just jobs, what quality of jobs, which means what other additional benefits are apply to those jobs. Taxes, do these companies pay taxes? Um, there is uh, labor practices, uh, child labor. Um, so there is a variety of metrics that we measure over time, and it is part of our side letter with the GP. We ask them annually to report to us against those metrics. Thank you. Um, I'm aware that there may be burning questions in the audience. Um, I have a lot more questions for the panelists. Anybody at this point? Any questions from the audience? All right, then let's keep going. On the, um, the question of metrics, anybody else want to weigh in? Because I think 33 metrics is too many. Um, I, I would like to, to be able to reduce it to less than five, um, the real metrics that, that matter. Yeah, and we, we have fewer, but we have the advantage of being a, a, a very specific initiative. So uh, um, uh, we, we would count five or six. And for us, it's very basic things. It's uh, how much employment do we, do we create? Are women being employed? Uh, what is the number of families that are benefiting from, uh, from uh, the investment made by Moringa? Um, how, many, um, how many acres of, uh, of land have we reforested? How many acres of sustainable agriculture has been created? Uh, how much uh, CO2 has been sequestered. All these things uh, are very specific to what we're doing, um, but it links into the exit question in a certain sense. And, and uh, if at the end of the involvement of Moringa, if, we have, if we're not successful in communicating what the business achieves on the ESG points in the same way as we would always have to be on the financial points, then we've basically failed. We have to be able to communicate something which is clear to potential buyers about what the business achieves on those three axes. I, I think these are extremely practical answer, answers. Maureen, do you want to say anything? Oui, bien sûr. Nous sommes, peu, nous sommes sur la même we are in complete agreement. It's all an issue of reporting. We send questionnaires to the companies in which we've invested. And I think that as we have an investment strategy which is multi-sectorial, we must divide up these criteria depend on the strike, criteria, um, depend on the sector, starting with the financial sector. It's a lot easier for us to know how many accounts have been op opened, how many rural agencies have been opened, Opened, how many women profited from our funding, how many SMEs benefited from 
funding. What was the size of these fundings for the SMEs? What is the average size of the companies in a portfolio of a company? What are the sectors of activity? All these are components which allow us to analyze the impact on a given sector, which is the financial sector. As for consumption sectors, well, we have impact measurement criteria, which are more run of a mill, how many jobs have been created, how many employees are getting training, how do we gender equality, how many women, the average age, and the impact of funding on the improvement on each of these criteria? But one thing is really key. On top of measuring some impacts, we want to really understand how the activity of the entity in itself improves as ties go on as these practices are implemented. Take one simple example, one example from a bank in Ghana, Fidelity Bank, which was a bank that focused on corporate so that is Ghanaian middle class, we led this bank to develop account creation modes for poorer people. We led them to develop funding um, criteria for rural population. Now, if they opened an account, or a smart account that can be opened in under a minute, which allows them to bank on Ghanaian population who had no access to bank accounts and who didn't live in the cities. So that means that nowadays, since we entered this bank, this bank has been able to open 300,000 accounts through a population which is a very rural population and which was completely out of bankerization. This allowed them to bankerize 3% of the Ghanaian population, which is huge. This has a huge impact on the measurement of the jobs created and the amount of women in a company. That's concrete and that's what's interesting for us. Thank you. And, and um, you mentioned, Paul, um, the, the choice of school. Uh, but very hard to measure. And um, I, I just wanted to let the audience know that we're aware of these costs. We're each of us trying to come up with metrics that matter, but it's very difficult to compare the benefit of educating one child relative to the benefit of saving one child's life through a healthcare investment. So, as we move forward and as the DFIs evolve their metrics, the other question, of course, is the cost of measurement. Randomized custom trials are very expensive. I think MIT's JPAL is one of the best, but very expensive. There are also false positives, time consuming. So we've all got to work on this, focusing on the key metrics, measuring them, agreeing, GPs, LPs, so we will have the evidence and it'll be embedded. We've, um, we've run out of time, but I just want to thank the panelists, not only for what they've said today, but more importantly, what they've done. There's so many conferences going on around the world. We talk a lot, but these people are actually investing. I commend you for it. With 2.7 billion people in the world living on less than $2 a day, and many of them in Africa, we really owe it to these people and all of those of you in the audience who are actually out investing with impact. So I commend all of you. <laughs>